say yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. One of the problems about speaking last is that one gets so infuriated and interested by one's opponent's comments, so I had to completely tear up the speech I made and um, answer a lot of what they say. Um, so you'll uh, forgive me if I occasionally stop and look at the notes I've been scribbling. First thing I want to say is I'm delighted to be here, but I'm dismayed that 50 years after we moved towards a comprehensive system, which has been a tremendously problematic because a lot of people in politics, not least all those independently educated politicians in the Tory party and maybe even the Labour party have a problem with it, we are still discussing this same issue. Let me say three quick things about the history because Bernard has dealt with it. The evidence is absolutely clear. Robert McCartney may have done well at a grammar school. I salute his personal experience. Selective education, on the whole, did not serve working class children well, even for many of those who won places at them. Secondly, all the evidence on social mobility, if you read John Goldthorpe, who is the expert on social mobility, he says it is not to do with education. There were um, employment opportunities opened in the post-war period, and there was more opportunity for people to move into professional and managerial jobs and Philip Collins of the Times, who is no supporter of conferences, has said definitively, looking at all the evidence, it is nothing to do with our education system. Thirdly, I would remind Graham Brady that if he wants to bring back selective education on a national scale, it was Tory voters and angry Tory parents who, in the end, finished the system off. I quote Simon Jenkins, the journalist, when he said that Edward Boyle, the Tory Minister of Education in the 1960s, was torn limb from limb by angry parents whose children were rejected and were sent to the secondary moderns. So that's the three points about the history. I have to take issue with Graham's view that secondary moderns and grammars are considered equal. I take issue with the idea that children are different. I actually agree with Michael Gove that all children should have a rigorous academic education in as much as they can, up to 16, and then you specialise. So I think this idea, I, I've looked at Graham's, made some lovely videos about Trafford, and he goes to Altrim, his old school, and then he goes to Wellington, the secondary modern, and I felt uneasy about it. And I know that I, as a child, would not have been happy to be sent to a secondary modern to be told to do more practical and artistic things, and I would not be happy for my children to have been sent there either. The other thing that none of us have said is it's not just about failure, and it is about failure. At the heart of selection, it's a policy about telling 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds that they failed. That's why you mustn't reverse your original view and bring and support this motion. But um, it is about failure. But all, yeah, So that's a very important thing. It's about designating a lot of people second best. And all the evidence of people who have failed the 11 plus, and some very famous and clever people have failed the 11 plus, it's all nonsense, that's what I was going to say, that people change. The person you are at 11, the things you know at 11, you might develop at 15 or 16, but you have been told, before you've reached puberty, that you're not, you're different, to use Graham Brady's term. Now, I think the support of selective education now, and again, I have to quarrel with Graham Brady, Trafford is an unusual place, it is relatively well off, and it gets good results, because well off areas get good results. And actually, the prior attainment into that secondary modern Wellington is very high for any part around the country. But look at selection, the 15 selective areas generally. This year, thousands of children will sit the 11 plus and thousands will fail. I feel ashamed that I live in a country where we still do that. But if you look around at those selective authorities, the ones who are failing are poorer children. Nationally, in grammar schools, there's about 3% of children on free school meals, which is an approximate indicator. In other state schools, there are 17%, and actually I read a report today said it was 28%. There's a real imbalance there. And the Financial Times did a detailed and definitive analysis of selective education. They found good results in Trafford, unsurprising, given that it's relatively well off. But they said, absolutely unequivocally, poor, ch poor children do dramatically worse in selective areas. Now look, all education policy in this country is now focused on improving the education of poor children. That's what Michael Gove was all about. I have huge problems with Michael Gove, but he was passionate about that. And the way to do that is to continue the comprehensive revolution and to make it better. And nobody would say that there weren't mistakes. I think Anthony Crossan is absolutely irrelevant. What some publicly educated Labour minister said 50 years ago about ruining the fucking grammar schools has nothing to do with the effort of thousands and thousands of people today, including Teach First, including all of us, to make our comprehensive schools really good. 
Robert McCartney is also wrong to say that the only good comprehensives are in rich areas. If you go to somewhere like Town Hamlets, you go to Mulberry School, which I've spoken at some of their events, two thirds of those girls are on free school meals, 79% of them part get to five good A to C GCSEs, you know that marker. 89% of them go to university. That is what our modern education system is about moving towards and that's what we have to support, not to go back to this failed policy that is going to increase inequality and anyway parents aren't going to put up with it, I'm going to tell Graham Brady now, he's going to have people tearing him limb from limb and he looks much too nice to have that happen to him. And the, f the other thing I would say is internationally, Andrew Schleicher, who is the global supremo, Michael Gove called him the most important man in, in English education, although he's the head of the OECD, he said only this week, it was very kind of him as we were having this debate, he said that this idea that equality and excellence can, um, equality and excellence can't coexist is again totally old fashioned. The top performing systems in the world, from Finland to Japan, Singapore to Hong Kong, are comprehensive in intake. And what they do is work really hard to raise standards for all. You also mentioned Diane Ravitch. Diane Ravitch should not be brought into your case. Diane Ravitch believes in really good local state schools. And it doesn't mean you can't have academic excellence. We know around the country, lots of children go to comprehensives, they go through, they go to Oxbridge, they go to universities like this. It's just nonsense to say that you can't do well in a comprehensive, but it doesn't mean that we don't have to keep working. My final point is, you mentioned about Trafford. I don't, we must be looking at different evidence, and that's politics, isn't it? You use your evidence, I use mine. But I was looking at the top 20 boroughs in terms of performance. <coughs> And actually London boroughs, which are not well off, which are not drawing on the better off of, of Trafford, are now among the 20 highest performing authorities in the country. So I'm here to tell you that if we keep working at it, comprehensive education can work and it will benefit all of us. Do not support this motion. Thank you.